Hello and welcome to this episode of Talk the Talk, RTRFM's weekly show about linguistics, the science of language. For the next hour, we're going to be bringing you language news, language acquisition, and some great music. Maybe we'll even hear from you. My name's Daniel Midgley. I'm here with Ben Ainsley. Good morning. And Kylie Sturgis. Good day, everyone. Babies do a great job of learning language, but it's still a pretty complex undertaking. Who wouldn't want to help the little tackers figure it out? But does anything help babies learn language? Baby signs? Special toys? We're delving into the research on this episode of Talk the talk. I feel like you're too close to this issue, Daniel. Why? Because I've got a six-month-old. You've got a tiny child, so I, I feel like your 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 eyes are too close on the project. You need to step back. If only be there a little was... little uh, Piaget project going on here. Somebody said you shouldn't use your children as a scientific experiment, and I'm like, why shouldn't you use your children as a scientific <laughs> I, experiment? You know what? I'd go sample further than that. Sample size one. Or if <laughs> you have twins, sample <laughs> size two. Uh, one, one is a one. control. I think I think you need to go further than that, though. <laughs> that person needs to be informed. Oh no, I'm so sorry. You don't understand. They're all science experiments. I'm just aware mm. of it. When was a child ever not no, a science yeah, yeah, experiment? Yeah, yeah. I love the idea of having twins and naming one of them experiment and the other one control. <laughs> control. control. Oh, you just like, that's it. I've got to have triplets or quadruplets. So, you know, you can like, okay, randomization and blind testing. Here we go. I was at a friend's house the other day uh, and she has three daughters, a six-year-old, a three-year-old and a fresh human. Um <laughs> And I said, oh, so, you know, sort of what's the dynamic between your eldest and your former youngest, your middle? She said, well, you know, um, child A came along and, and she sort of got our attention by achieving, by doing well. And then child B came along and... Well, kind of filled in the gaps that were left over. <laughs> oh, I see. So oh, basically, man. child B is just kind of like, Woo! Well, it's important to find your niche. <laughs> yes. <Indeed. Yeah. laughs> now, before we go too far down the rabbit hole, why don't we find out about what's been going on in the world of linguistics in the week on past? Okay, here's the news. Emoji are back. Uh, <laughs> Did they ever leave? No, they're still with us. You know, I'm an emoji madman. Mm. I am throwing noticed. the things around. Like, ever since our show with Vivian Evans, I have been sort of using them where appropriate. Mm. Well, in places... who makes the shoulds, Daniel? Well, who makes the shoulds? Yeah. Well, what I do is I try to observe what people are doing. And, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of emoji in the work emails I'm getting. Touche. But he mentioned the angry jerk phenomenon where you type out something and it's like, da 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 but by the time it gets to them, it's like, da 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 Right. And now that I've been throwing in a lot of emoji, I am mistaken for an angry jerk 75% less. Ah, oh. this is the classic colon capital P. Exactly. This is how you denote to people that you just, it's all right. I know this could sound really intense if you read it through the spectrum of, please get this done immediately. Mm -hmm. And so, ah, pfft. Smiley face. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't help the times when I actually am being an angry jerk. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now anyone who corresponds with you and get some missive sans emojis, they know that you're just super cheesed off. <laughs> <Just being pissed. laughs> well, Caitlin showed us this emoji story. We know that emoji are useful for adding a light touch to our conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, Samsung mm -hmm. has invented an emoji translator called Weemoji. Weemoji, like, as in like Nintendo, W-I-I? No, it's just an E, okay. like as in us, we. Right, okay, okay. But what it does is it takes the things you type, mm -hmm. the sentences you type, and turns them into emoji, like <laughs> strings of them. Oh. Yeah. So, for example, how are you, if you type mm -hmm. that, it turns into a smiley face, an okay hand gesture, and a question mark. Ah, uh, are you okay day kind of thing. Kind of thing. Yeah. Sounds annoying. Yeah, well, it's... It sounds like the world of emojis that I have the least toehold in, right? Like, so, like, if you see sort of like uh, Tinder profiles or um, Instagram posts and stuff, which are just long strings of emojis, I have, I, I, I don't want to be the old man who yells at clouds, but I feel very <laughs> tempted to be. Mm. That's what I thought when I saw it, but then I was alerted to perhaps a better function. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people who, because of a brain injury or trauma, have uh, some kind uh, of aphasia, uh, right, right, right. unable to process written language like the rest of us can. 
but this would be a way for them to be able to communicate or understand because, you know, the brain handles pictures a little bit different mm. from written language. This might be a way to reach them. I wonder how functional this would be in terms of day-to-day ongoing communication for these people. Surely better than nothing. I haven't seen all of the strings that have been used, but it looks like Samsung worked with uh, a speech therapist, Francesca Polini, to make 140 of these different strings in lots of different areas like um, emergencies or food or emotions, and it's intended to cover a lot of the day-to-day situations that someone might be in. Maybe it's going to be like the original stereotypes, like the the three-letter clusters for the and whatnot in printing presses that were just used so oh. often that they just made ones like January and that sort of thing that were all just bolted together so you didn't have to line them up. And so now there's 140 little emoji chains that everyone's just slowly going to understand. Oh, yeah, cool. That's like, are you okay? And see you in 10 minutes. You and open up a menu in a restaurant and it's got it all listed yeah. in emoji because it's like, oh, yeah, that's porridge. Okay, yeah, that, that, that. I guess nobody's going to get it right the first time, though. So I'd be interested to see if people got these in their hands, if the um, the symbols or the strings would change or evolve. Yeah. So the crowdsourcing of 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 the um, the accepted emoji norms, the canon. Yeah, the canon, the law. Mm. <laughs> yeah. What would people need? In other emoji news, mm-hmm. the Android system is losing its blobby emoji. It's blobby emoji? What's blobby? Hold on, I've got, okay, I've got an Android. Check. We're checking our phones. It seems that instead of having round faces like on yeah. iOS, oh. you've got kind of these gumdroppy yeah, yeah, sort yeah, yeah, of yeah. blobs. And I've think? always kind of liked the fact that they're different. It have pleases you? me, yeah. Okay. Uh, some people, it annoys. Some people feel like it's ugly. So they're finally going to get rid of it, are they? Well, here was the deal. You know how there are always new emoji coming on all the time? Naturally. And some of these are very specific, like female doctor. But how do you have a female doctor blob or the engineer blob? Ah, I see what you mean. David Bowie rock star blob. Yep. uh, Mm. mm. See, because when they get to to actual Mm. humans with things, like they just turn back into people. They just do humans, right? Well, this will allow Google's Android system to have a more uniform look across the emojis. Oh, there we go. Okay. Mm. Look, I'm not against it. I'm not going to sort of like pour a 40 on the curb for the blobby style, but (laughs) cool. So things are moving in the emoji world. There you go. Hey, I would love to hear what our listeners use regularly as their little emoji strings. What are your, like, go-to five or six emoji strings that you think just conveys really obvious meaning? You can get in touch with us on our Facebook page. You can throw a few emoji strings there, and we can try and decipher what your code is. Mm. Uh, Our Facebook group is where all the cool slash really nerdy people hang out, so you should hang out there as well. <laughs> we have a nice Venn diagram. It's pretty yeah, much yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. in the middle of there. Or you, know, you can give us a call on 9260-9210. You can't send us any emoji there, though. No. You can tweet us at TalkRTR. Where or... you can emoji. Oh, emoji <laughs> the heck out of that. Or send me an email, talk the talk at rtrfm.com.au. Why don't we take a track? Okay, how about the Love Junkies with different faces on RTRFM 92.1. And today on Talk the Talk, we are experimenting on children. We're not experimenting Mm. on children. But we are talking about what helps the little tackers to learn. Well, I kind of feel like I've been brought into the studio under false pretenses. I was promised children experimentation and now... (laughs) I'm I'm fairly certain there's like a little subclause in the uh, broadcasting uh, ethics criteria for community radio. If you can show me the bit that says explicitly may not experiment on children, then I'll agree with you. But until you show me that... Kylie, I will remain slightly perturbed at the lack of experimentation. I'm slightly perturbed at the box of babies that are sitting out in the corridor. Yes. At the getting ready to be <laughs> yes. Tested. I, to think I was this close to bringing a six-month-old into the studio. Oh, really? <laughs> but then you thought about it for more than a second yeah, and you were like, thought, that's a terrible mm, idea. Ben's here. No, probably not. Mm. Now, let's talk about what it is that helps children to learn language. First of all, there's no hurry. They will get it eventually unless mm. there's a very good reason. But every parent wants the best for their kids. I certainly do. And so... We I'm compare children. We say, oh, the oldest one was speaking at, you know, two oh. months and was riding a bicycle by the time he was six months. Only kind of for the crazy people who decide to have more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a competitive streak with parents, Mm. and I think that we feel like if we're not hitting the benchmarks, then it's like, oh, no, something terrible is happening. And that's not true. I've been collecting examples of research for a while now that talk about what kind of things help, what kind of things hurt, and what kind of things don't really matter either way. Okay, so I'm really glad you mentioned that, because something that I want to get out in the open straight off the gate is I feel like babies are second 
only to nutrition in terms of non-science, terrible nonsense that is just <laughs> yes. out there, published, mm-hmm. well. just look, for sale. Like the amount of courses and stuff that I see where a second of critical thought just goes, everything you're talking about is completely unsubstantiated nonsense. Uh, just hundreds they of dollars. Up. Yeah, they eat, eat it up. Because mm. parents are so, so, uh, especially with your first kid, I think. Mm. So. You bring it home, there's no instruction yeah, yeah. book. Oh, geez, we're going to break it. And then. You're scared. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. fear. There just, is mm. fear with your first kid. And then there's all these people who are like, are you scared? I've got the solution. Just pay me. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Well, that's why we're here to bring a bit of clarity to this discussion by talking about. Things from the research. Now, obviously, none of these studies is the last word, but I hope that we can build up an overall picture. Excellent. So let's start with the good. First of all, I want to ask you your views, both of you. Okay. Okay. Do these things help, hurt, or no effect? Okay. Okay. Here we go. Baby signs. Baby signs. Not the same as like Auslan or ASL. I'm not talking about teaching your child a, a whole sign language. I mean like teaching them individual signs that can help them to signal things that they might want. Okay, so pause. Are we asking if it helps them to signal things that they want or it helps them develop language sooner? Will it help them to develop language sooner? Uh, I'm going to go with no. Okay. I'm going to go with no effect, yeah. Okay, interesting. Any reason? Uh, Just because it seems like... The, the brain is a natural pattern recognition software already, so I don't think you need to sort of go to them, hey, you know, like, I know you can't use words yet, but if you make this sign and you associate it with water, then you get that people have to associate things with water. I think the brain naturally does that. Mm-hmm. Giving them a hand gesture to do it sooner is not going to help the process of actually forming the words. I feel like the bottleneck is at the word forming stage. Okay. My impression is that it's not going to actually help the child, but it's going to have an influence on the parents because the parents are going to be making more of an effort to sign and make all these particular mm. gestures so they're going to be more empathetic and more noticing if these more. particular ones are being used. I more will responsive. say as well more responsive. just because I'm saying it might not necessarily help the kids get language sooner I'm not saying it's not helpful. I think mm. it would be I, mm. I found it really helpful when my kid who couldn't use language was like doing a hand gesture for water over and over and over again. I was like oh, okay cool you want water I can do that <laughs> okay. that's helpful. Okay <laughs> electronic toys that say words uh, ooh, ooh. not helpful it's all input. Hmm. But you're not going to be associating it with voices and stuff like that. But kids love tapes and CDs and things. I'm going to say, yeah, just, just take a, a, a punt on A that thin one. yes? A thin yes. Okay. Handheld devices like phones, are they going to stall your children's language development or will nah. they help it? Oh, okay. So all of my yeses and nos are, are conditional under the idea that they're not doing these things so much to the exclusion of other normal being alive activities, right? Fair enough. Mm. Um, so just like a bit of phone usage or a bit of pad usage, no. Okay. Mm. Sticking no the child in front of the television for hours yeah, on end yeah, yeah. and saying, mm. oh, yeah, he's picking up language, N- yeah. Okay. So I'm but gonna no, say- I'm going to say devices are not a um, a halting mechanism on language acquisition. So okay. maybe no effect. It might okay. be, yeah, maybe um, a slight effect, but certainly nothing particularly damaging. It's Listening slight. to music. Uh, I'm going to go with no effect again. Net positive, net negative. Okay, we're talking about the Mozart effect where we suddenly have babies who are going to be hearing all these... Concert pianists. Yes, (laughs) sounds, and suddenly their IQ goes flailing out the window. I don't know. Again, you might give them excellent music taste, but in terms of acquiring Mm. language, I'm going to say no effect. That yeah. has actually been one of the claims, you know, baby Mozart things makes children smarter and it's just, it, it's, it's junk, right? Yeah. yeah, I had a head of department who said, oh, we have to get all this Baroque music. And I just had all these students just looking at me in pain mm. saying, please, Like, if you're going to do it as well, like, let's oh. get some boss dog contemporary composers like mm. Arvo Pert and stuff. Oh, awesome. Like, just get these kids closing their eyes and going to, like, different planes of existence. <laughs> Using baby talk words with repetitive syllables. Well, uh, give me an example. I don't know this like, one. Na na instead of nu ni. Uh, I am going to say uh, not helpful, not negative. Oh, actually, no. I am going to say helpful insofar as I think they'll start saying the simplistic not words before they'll start saying the words. Okay. But in terms of acquiring the actual precise words, I still got to say I reckon they would have done it at whatever speed they were going to do it, whether they've got da do first. Okay. But we do that all the time anyway, it seems mm. like. Da, 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 da. Yes, that's da, da. That's da, da. Yeah, so, it's pretty hard not to, it's, A, it, speak about yourself in the third person as a yep. parent. I find that very difficult to get outside of. Daniel does too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Dad does too. <laughs> I think I think we have a natural tendency towards it, and it's not going to be harmful. Yeah. And I definitely use baby talk all mm. the time. Okay. This is fun. It's just yeah. silly. It is. Yeah. Pretending to understand what they say. Uh, ooh. ooh. So they say stuff that doesn't make any sense. I don't that, talk to that, 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 that. Oh, oh, it my sounds God. like you're feeling very upset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say this one might actually be helpful. Okay. I'm going to go on the helpful front on this. I say helpful because you don't want to end up just ignoring the child and the child just... (laughs) Okay. And never actually working on their language skills because they think, well, using or at least attempting to use language doesn't seem to be getting me anywhere. I might as well just sit here and go... Mm -hmm. Or nothing, right? Or just climb up. Or quite not. Reading the same stories over and over again. Oh! love doing that. <laughs> it's That's, fun. And then you practice different voices and then they can read along with you and they start following along with the words and they can say, ah, I know what this page is. Problem is if um, you're really tired and you skip a page, you think, okay, I might be able to skip a few pages and no. get out of here early. Mm. No, you missed you that didn't one. You do the bit. Never mind, mummy. You can start from the beginning all <laughs> over again. So reading over not reading, I think helpful. Reading the same stories over reading different stories, I would say if there's an advantage, it would be a very thin one. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of these. Okay. Okay. Did we write these down? Because I really want to beat Kylie. <laughs> As a as well, a baseline, maybe maybe our listeners can keep track and let okay. us know okay. who who do you think is the winner here. That is not so it's going to be me. <laughs> baby signs. The claim is that using baby signs is a way of getting children to use language earlier. It's claimed that it might help with frustration. And because they can say things that they want or feel, but they are not able to use Orange actual juice, words. For example, mm. Orange okay, juice. right. Uh, it's also claimed to help accelerate speech development and increase IQ. Mm. But when you trace this back to the source, you find that a lot of these claims are actually just from opinion articles, not science articles. Mm. I love when people do that because I personally really enjoy when, like. Alex Terwilliger's opinion underpins my child's development. That's just the best. It's the best. Yeah. Elizabeth Kirk from the University of York has done some research on this. Kylie, you've got some things on yeah, this. Yeah, uh, they found that parents' use of signs did not result in better child language outcomes. But they had um, mixed studies. So they reviewed 10 studies that investigated the impact of baby signs on uh, children's language development. And they found that the evidence was overall unclear whether it might help children's language skills. Right. Yeah. And what Kirk found was there was no significant impact on language development. They didn't learn to talk mm. any earlier. And their their language didn't progress any faster than babies who didn't get any signs. Mm. But it did help parents feel more engaged. Yeah, when they flipped it around mm. and said, OK, you think we're looking at the kids. We're actually looking at the parents <laughs> here. Uh, they found that mothers, one study found that mothers who were taught to sign with the kids became more responsive to children's distress than those who didn't sign. Oh, okay. And signing may help you attune to your child's feelings and interests more. So, baby sign, great. Just not going to make them learn language. But, but there was one other effect, and that was that parents who chose to attend a baby signing class had significantly higher stress levels. Mm. How interesting. Well, it might attract stressed out parents who are like oh, super driven okay, and yeah. stuff. So you're getting like a little bit of confirmation bias almost. I, seriously, if this is something that you find helps you out, you're for it. It's helping you to communicate in, in some fashion or form. And hey, it's fun for you and the kid. Go for it. If yeah. you like it, you should do it. Yeah. For sure. Okay, electronic toys that say words. Uh, I believe my answer to this was nah. nah. Mine was yeah, maybe uh, it's it's making words and sounds. Maybe it might be slightly more interesting than having mum stand over you the entire time going orange juice, or, orange juice, <laughs> or in my orange house. Juice. No, <laughs> no, 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 Ellis, no, <laughs> no, no. What's in your mouth? No, out of the mouth. Out of them. What is this? Blue tack? <laughs> oh, gross. Ew. That stuff's tasty. <laughs> <laughs> this one comes from Anna Souza and a team from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. Their results were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics. They examined parents and kids in their homes aged 10 to 16 months, and they found that when there were electronic toys that said words... The parents stopped talking. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, so this is another this impact coming. of, um, yeah, let's it's turn it around and yeah. have a look at what happens to the parents. And oh, it's also geez. a distraction engine, right? Like if if the thing makes the kid not 
be like needy of your attention, then as as a parent, you know, it's like, oh, great, I can get some marking done, mm, I can do the exactly, dishes, right? I can do the it's vacuuming, great. but when they're not being needy, you're not talking to them. That's mm. right. And so that's why I think it's good that babies cry and need attention, because mm. otherwise we would just put them in a corner and ignore <laughs> yeah. them. And just wait for them to become an adult slowly <laughs> over time. <laughs> Into the pupa, there we go. Hatch is a butterfly later. Mm. But when there are traditional toys like blocks or little trains or whatever, then parents comment more about the toy. Oh, you're building a tower. Oh, look, that's a piggy. Oh, mm. and so decreased input from parents is not really a great predictor of language skill. Right, right, Probably right. Probably not helpful. I don't know if it leads to worse outcomes, but it does lead to less parent speech. So if you think that kids learn from parent input, then this is not going to help language mm. input. Or are we back to backing this onto the phones and tablets? Kind of. This is a study from Dr. Catherine Birkin from the Hospital for Sick Children. Mm-hmm. What a name. I does, love that name. Does mm. right what it says on the box. There you go. <laughs> now, I'm not anti-computer or anti-technology or anything. <laughs> I, just, I just I would love to meet the person who would claim you were. <laughs> exactly. But Dr. Birkin and the team found that by their 18-month checkups, they found that the more handheld screen time a kid gets, the more likely the children were to have delays in expressive speech. Oh, so this one is categorically a hurdy one. But you're going to find kids using these all the time in restaurants and in cars. The parents say, yep, okay, crack open your iPad and you play with that whilst Daddy and I fight over how much we're going to spend on the wine menu. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has uh, put out a statement, not because of this study, they've already done this, but to discourage any kind of screen media for children younger than 18 months. I think that makes sense. Because mm. it, it, it is associated with some delays, not in other things like social interaction or gesture, but as far as expressive speech. Or their high, speech, s- high score on Halo, for example. No, no, yeah. that's fine. Mm. But for expressive speech, it does seem to have be associated with some delays. So if they're under 18 months, maybe don't give them heaps of phone time. Maybe not. Mm. Let's take a track now. Indeed. And we'll come back and tackle the others on our list. This one is Child Saint with Dessert on RTRFM 92.1. This week, we're talking about babies and language and how to help, not help, or even hinder their language development. That's right. We found that baby sign, inconclusive, probably no help. Electronic toys and handheld devices, not great. Damaging for the littlies under 18 months, maybe don't give them those things. Yeah. But let's talk about something else. Listening to music. You guys thought that maybe this was a net positive? Well, I mean, like I said, uh, you might give them an appreciation for Radiohead. Mm, if you sing along with the child with the song and, and, yeah, pick up language that way, that wouldn't be too bad. This, Wash your face with orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> well, this study comes from Christina Zhao of the University of Washington. This was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. They got 20 of the babies listened to music while they sat with their parents and drummed on stuff, you know, in rhythm. I love, I love, wait, just to be clear, the parents are drumming on stuff in rhythm. Because well, think... you just know the babies are not drumming on stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if the kid is laying down some sick beats. Right? But the other 19 babies got uh, toys and blocks, but no music. Ah. Then they gave all the babies brain scans using magnetoencephalography. MRIs? No, no this uh, is different. E- EKGs? No, it's an MEG. It's different because they're little ones, so it'd be slightly different. So it's less invasive, is that right? Yeah, so here's the deal. Your brain is always giving off tiny, tiny, tiny magnetic signals. Sure. Mm-hmm. They're hard to detect. So what you got to do is get somebody in a shielded room and get super sensitive equipment. But you can see what's going on. Whoa. Yeah. So it's basically like those bits in the X-Men movies where they visualize people reading other people's minds. Oh, that's exciting. That would be nice. Whoa, I'd be I getting mean, into yeah. neuroscience. That's what and you elaborate. described, right? Like there's basically like a Faraday cage and then <laughs> yep. you put a baby inside it and you just listen really carefully to electromagnetic output. So then what they did after the training period was they took all the babies, gave them an MEG test, and they would play them some music, but occasionally the music would skip. There would be a break in the rhythm. Oh, like a like a record skipping kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And they would see which babies showed more brain activity. Guess which ones? The ones who listen to music. The ones who listen to music showed more brain activity. Now, now but hang on, mm. if I may. Does this not just suggest that we've trained them to hear a particular sequence and then when that sequence breaks they go, ah, sequence broken. That doesn't necessarily, in my brain, immediately go like hard arrow to language acquisition. No, it doesn't. But what it does do is it shows that they show increased skill in pattern recognition. Uh, Essential in language. And controlling attention, which is also pretty languagey. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. 
And I'm still going to do music and bang around oh, with my kid anyway. Oh, it's just so much fun. And in terms of interactivity and bonding and, and yeah, having a shared hobby, as it were, it's mm. awesome. Now it's time to talk about baby talk with repetitive syllables. We've already done a show, Baby Talk or Not, a while ago. So mm. this is a little bit of a repeat, but a little bit of an update. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. It's an well, old what show. we thought was um, right now was that it wouldn't be too bad to have a bit of repetitive talk cause, simply because we do that all the time, don't mm. we? It's also babies. scaffolding and modeling. Like, you can't get all the way to, I can't believe I'm going to do this, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> but you might be able to get super duper. Yeah, okay. Right? It's very common. Well, this study comes from Mitsuhiko Ota of the University of Edinburgh, published in Language Learning and Development. What they would do is show babies two unfamiliar objects on a computer screen, okay. and a voice would read the names of the objects. One had identical syllables like dodo, and the other one had uh, unidentical syllables like bole or something like that. Right. So one was just two syllables repeated every time, dodo, ra, ra, ke, ke, yep. over and over and over again. And the other one was just not that. That's it. <laughs> and then they tested to see how well the infants recognized each made up word. And you can tell if a child recognizes it because they look at it longer. Mm-hmm. They pick out the right one with their eyes. And sure enough, recording to their eye movements showed that when there were duplicated words, they recognize those objects better. So da da is probably better than daddy. Pretending to understand what kids say. Ooh, good okay. question. What did we say on this okay, one? Okay, I said it's better than having the child give up and or tantrum. Yes. <laughs> so I think we both kind of said even if it doesn't help language acquisition, mm. doing it is definitely not going to hurt and it will probably yeah. have all kinds of other benefits outside of language acquisition. Mm. Well, this research comes from Julie Gros-Louis and a team from the University of Iowa and Indiana University. They looked at mothers and eight-month-old kids, although dads act kind of the same. Mm. And they found that mothers had two different kinds of reactions to stuff that their kids would be babbling. And one is that the mothers would redirect to something else. Okay. Look at this thing. The other group of moms would be what they called the sensitive responses, where they would imitate what the child did or try to interpret what the child did or talking to the child instead of talking about something else. Okay. The quote-unquote sensitive responses were basically ones that were actually taking what the child was doing and... Sort of mirroring it back. If not mirroring it, at least interpreting that in some way, as opposed to just getting some input from the kid and being like, hey, look a bird. I remember seeing this in a psychology textbook, and I even remember the text. It said, okay, darling, we're going to go out for a walk. See the tree. Yes, we're going to go see some trees. Who's? Yes, we might see some holes. X. And we might see some sticks as well. That's right. We might see some trees and holes and sticks. Let's go. That's the sensitive, reflecting Mm. parent. Okay. Well, then they examined the infants who had the mothers with sensitive responses, and they found that those babies had more consonant vowel vocalizations, not just ah, 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 right. but ba 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 like you like, like Carly was saying, X and mm. that sort of thing. Right. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to be doing if you're going to be speaking language. Right. Um, it looks more like real syllables. And also that the babies were more likely to direct what they were saying at their moms. Because just... they, can, they can feel it actually doing Ooh, something. Oh, this is they having can see an impact. Output. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They followed these babies along, and after 15 months, they found that these babies who had the sensitive responses were producing more words and gestures. Oh, there so, we go. if you want to help, one thing you can do is if your child babbles or says something, talk to them about what it is that they're saying. Help them know that what they're saying maybe has some sort of meaning, even if you're not sure what it is. The next step after that I've found as well is as your kid gets older is not letting them get away with not using words. Ah. So, so like the classic use your words, except for me it's more just like, Ellis, I know you know what to say and you're just being annoying. What do you want? <laughs> Water, please, Dad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Tormentor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reading books. Net positive? I said uh, reading over not reading, definitely positive. Mm-hmm. I love I was, reading, do it all the time. I was less sure. I said if there was an advantage of repetitive reading versus differentiated reading, it would be a very thin advantage. Okay. I think that um, being able to do both repetitive and variety is good because in repetitive you get to learn certain words better, I think. Okay. Well, a lot of the research that I found involves kids five years old and up, which is oh, no help for this yeah, purpose. That's difficult. But here's some involving babies. Carolyn Cates from NYU School of Medicine looked at 250 mother-baby pairs. 
uh, age six months and up to see how well they could understand words. And then they looked at the kind of book sharing that was going on in the home. They looked at the quantity, including time spent and number of books in the home. Yep. And then also the quality, like whether the parents would talk to the kids or whether the stories were age appropriate. Well, it seems that the better the quality and the quantity, that was a good predictor of yeah. child vocabulary and child vocalizations, uh, even up to four years later. Yep. Now, as far as repetitiveness, I found a study that showed that for kids with specific language impairment. Ah, uh, yep. Um, kids that got the same repetitive stories over and over again did really well later on word learning tests. That makes sense. Mm. So reading together is good. It gives them the idea that books are a thing. We can be books quiet are for the a while. Best. Books are great. <laughs> Time together. Mm. And don't forget also, when you're looking at a book together, you're focusing joint attention. And mm. yeah. focusing joint attention is one thing that language is really good at. Hey, help me do this thing. Or hey, look at that. So focusing joint attention, very bookish, very languageish. Right. Mm. I've, I once felt very sad to have uh, someone of my acquaintance say to me, why would I read to the child? He can learn it at school and he's not going to understand the books anyway. So this is something the teachers are going to have to do with them. And I said, you have such a fantastic science fiction library. You read extensively. You, you can't think about sharing this. And I promptly went out and got all sorts of wacky uh, children's books that you can get out there, which are not only great for kids, but also quite funny for parents. Even when my littlest would, had just come home from being born, I sat down with her and we you would read would. the you same would. stories. Just, yeah. this, just these board books and we would read every time. We just made it a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so jealous. Thing. Well, I, I yeah. used to be able to read with Ellis before he acquired the capacity to move of his, <laughs> under his own power. It was great. I would sit down and read with him for like 30 minutes. It was awesome. Oh. <sighs> oh. I'm sorry. Oh, poor ben. Finally, talking to kids a lot helps. They oh, just need lots and lots of input. I feel like this is the one where you don't really need the data, surely. Like, mm. surely this is one of those truism ones where, like, what, talking to kids helps them acquire language? No. Yeah, but... We have gone into research on this before mm -hmm. in uh, previous episodes in regards to how it's also a cultural thing, too. Yeah, and here's some research that's kind of new. Hannah Marno and a team from the Language Cognition and Development Lab at CISA in Italy, they got four months old in front of a computer screen, there would be a face mm -hmm. saying stuff. Either the face would be saying stuff or it would be saying stuff backwards because that removes the meaning. Yeah. Or it would just be silent. And then the person with the face would look either to the left or to the right and then there would be a pause and then a thing would appear. Okay. So they wanted to see if the language would make the babies look in the right place and they did. Kids who had the face that was saying stuff just honed in on where that thing was supposed to be, even though they didn't understand the language. Right. At all. They just followed the eyes of the person. That's right. Right. It's like this person's saying something and now they're looking. I guess that's significant. Whereas if it's a silent face and then looking, not so much. Oh. Interesting. So it, what's happening then is that the presence of human speech makes children look for... Take note. ...reference. Yeah. Yeah. It may, something's going to come up that you should look at. Okay, I'll look at the thing. Huge shout out to anyone out there who does research with children or babies mm. because Oof. you are just amazing. Just to be able to get enough sample sizes. Okay. Right. We said... It's, no, they're all crying. They're crying. We're crying. We've got to put a hold on it. Right. Okay. Someone get me a booby. Uh, <laughs> this one. Nappy. Nappy time. Okay. Now we'll run the test again. No, another nappy. Another nappy. So in general, just take children and pour buckets of yeah. language over them. They need lots and lots of input. Interpret what they're trying to say. Interact. Never stop jabbering. Uh, comment on things that you're seeing. Point out things that you notice. Um, a question that I get sometimes is, when should I be worried? So I just want to take a second mm. and Oh, that's that. a big one, yeah. A lot longer than you think yes. <laughs> is yes. the answer to that question. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I'm looking at a question on Linguist List, Ask a Linguist. You can find that on our blog, talkthetalkpodcast.com. But there's a lot of variation for kids. Mm. It, two years old, if they haven't spoken their first word, that is actually not that abnormal. Yeah. So here's the guide. If they haven't said their first word with a clear, recognizable meaning by 18 months, could be okay, but maybe you want to get it checked out. And if they haven't said like a full sentence by three years, then there might be a reason, and it could be something like a hearing problem mm. or attentional things. So maybe get that looked at. Excellent. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of territory today. 
<laughs> we have, and now I'm going to go home and uh, talk to Jabba. my baby. <laughs> let's, let's take a track. Yeah, let's do. Um, I wanted to listen to something by Kid Koala. This one is 8-Bit Blues on RTRFM 92.1. Funkalicious. Bum, bum, dum, dum, <laughs> And as the unwashed masses raise their pitchforks and their burning tar lamps aloft, storming the gates of the Bastille, demanding to know for the average man, what is the word of the week? Your word of the week intros have gotten stranger. What's Trump done this week? It's not about Trump, I'm telling you. It's not about Trump. Okay. It makes a nice change. It's about Mark Latham. Oh, oh cool. See, okay. that's as close as I could get yes. without okay. actually... Now, Mark Latham has reached his final uh, form. Yes, he oh. has. He has. I think he's Super Saiyan 4 now. Like, he's he's gone all the way through. Yeah, unfortunately, his final form is like everyone's unpleasant elderly I just uncle. had to envision this kaiju, Mark Latham, just stomping over Australia. Who is Mark Latham, for those who don't know? For those outside of Australia or lucky enough to be privileged enough not to have to care about Australian politics. Mark Latham is the former leader of the uh, Labour Party nationwide. Isn't that weird? Mm. Here in Australia. And has... I guess been reading too many like meninist red pill ish style vlogs and has just really gone down the libertarian rabbit hole. As a person who unfortunately ascribes to a couple of different libertarian philosophies, this guy's a real jerk. Well, in a Facebook post a couple of weeks ago, he announced he was joining the Liberal Democrats, which in the USA sounds like a fine thing to be. But <laughs> here in Australia, it's like, it's like. Why would you do that? What, the, what's the relevance? What? The one. The one literally the one notable gun advocate we have anywhere in the country yes. is a liberal democrat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, conservative small government libertarian kind of nut jobby. Yeah, the people who are too fringe for our version of the Republican Party mm. end up in this party. So he's slagged off safe schools as BS. And yeah, because pff, fuck gay people, right? <laughs> and kids. Yeah. Who needs who needs to who stop needs, them from yeah, committing suicide? Who needs suicide? kids getting bullied? You know, eh, whatever, grow up. He also mm. praised Andrew Bolt, the guy who was convicted of racist hate speech, as uh, a great champion of freedom of speech. Oh, yeah, geez, I love when people use their right to speech well by being like, do you know who suck? Dark people. <laughs> <laughs> um, in his post, he mentioned that he joined this party and it was opposing three things. Political correctness, uh-huh. social engineering. Well, I don't know what that is. See, I know. Record scratch noise, right? Yeah. And can you name the third? Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You got Women. it. No. no, no, no. Social justice warriors. No. Nope. That's, well, that's political correctness. Oh, yeah. is it? Um, it's a phrase that they always use in connection oh. with these other two phrases. Freedom of speech? Cultural Marxism. Oh, oh that's, that's one I haven't had rear its head for a while. It's going to make Helen Razor happy because she's really into yeah, Marx and so on. <laughs> okay, but, you know... He's are, against cultural Marxism, I'm presuming. Uh, right. Yeah. These are dog whistle words. Right. Yeah. And if you're not in this community, you might be going, what? Social engineering definitely records What is this all about? Okay, well, let's talk about some of these terms. So political correctness, we've talked about that before. Is clearly code for, can I please go back to being subtly racist and sexist? Uh-huh. And, and whenever somebody complains about PC, I always say, what is it that you'd like to say that you feel you can't? Yes. Um, so, phrase finder reports that this term dates back in some form to 1793. Damn, but I've got to assume it doesn't mean what we think it means. It wasn't. Uh, The author, a J. Wilson, was using it to say that we should focus on people. The United States, instead of the people of the United States, is the toast given. This is not politically correct. Ah, okay. So it's literally just talking about, like, protocol, essentially. Mm. But in Tori Cade's essay, The Black Woman, she mentions this in 1970. A man cannot be politically correct and a chauvinist, too. Okay, there we go. Um, Well, it sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. Social engineering. This phrase pops up every once in a while. Tony Abbott used it uh, in uh, about a year ago, calling for safe schools to be axed. Ah, Because it's socially engineering people to not hate gays? He said it's not an anti-bullying program. It's a social engineering program. I I can only guess that social engineering means trying to make something better using a government program. Right. Yeah, I I hate when governments... (laughs) 
try and Social make things engineering. better. Yeah, maybe it ties into the yeah shutting down free speech. Everyone's got to be the same. The, the term comes from an 1894 essay by Dutch industrialist J.C. Van Marken. The idea oh, was yeah. that just like we have mechanical engineers right. and structural engineers, we need social engineers to solve social problems. Which is a uniquely engineery idea. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've, I've seen this done in a few different parts of history and engineers are very good at designing machines and almost universally <laughs> terrible at designing social policy. Oh, okay, God. well, this is the kind of thing that makes some people on the right-wing side think that no social engineering should ever happen. We're just supposed to let whatever happens happen, even though that is a form of social policy. And then, for our last phrase, cultural Marxism. Okay, yeah, so explain this one to me, because I understand... Uh, sort of viewing the world through like a Marxist paradigm, sure. right? I'm not sure how much this actually has to do with Marxism. I mean, people on the right wing have a really bizarre fascination with Marxism. Th this term cultural Marxism is used to to criticize progressives as like secret communists or something. And right, then like, you look so at Donald Trump. Sorry, I brought up Donald Trump again. Then you look at Donald Trump's relationship with Russia and you go, okay, what? The, the, for, to be fair, the, they're very, very not communists. That's true. They are insanely <laughs> it has capitalist. Changed. They're, Quite They're a lot over time. Kleptocracyist. Yeah. There's a strange fascination with homophobia, like Cory Bernardi and George Christensen, two uh, very right wing politicians, have criticized the Safe Schools program, the anti bullying LGBT program, as cultural Marxism. Because they want to seize and collectivize farmland? Like, I don't, I actually don't understand. I see the social engineering thing, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'll even agree with them. I guess that is social engineering. I just don't hate it, and you do. So, great, whatever. But how is it cultural Marxism? Well, the cultural Marxism angle comes because the right wing is extremely homophobic. Right. But... This term is also kind of anti-Semitic. See, in the Nazi days, people thought that the Jews were behind some ongoing Marxist plot to corrupt and weaken the West. Right. Part of that was political, but also part of it was sexual, because, of course, people who are politically conservative care so much about what other people are doing with their bits. Mm. So when somebody uses the term cultural Marxism, they are literally recycling Nazi propaganda that was used in Germany in that time. That's... Really gross. Yeah, it is. And so what they literally mean is that's lefty nonsense, basically. That's what it means. Right, okay. And somebody who espouses these kinds of things isn't just wrong, but is somehow politically dangerous, like they're trying to weaken our wonderful society. Yeah, yeah okay. So that's what's behind the notion of cultural Marxism. So M Mark Latham literally just busted out a trio of dog whistles mounted to his fist and just went, a toot 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 toot. In perfect three-part harmony. Nice one. Oh, well done. So language identifies us as members of a group, and when somebody uses these terms, you can be pretty sure that, especially when they use them together, they are showing themselves as a member of a group of political right-wing extremists promoting paranoia, M McCarthy era fears of communism co-occurring in a weird way with homophobia. Can, Can we, we make like an urban dictionary just for dog whistling? Like could we make that? Like a wiki dog whistle page? Well, I got to say it's already kind of being done. The Rational Wiki page okay. is really really good mm. for this stuff. It's somebody from the rational community, but they also have a, like a, a linguisty kind a of linguisty bent and they throw out these phrases. So you can find that on our blog talkthetalkpodcast.com. There's lots of good stuff in there. And people can contribute to it as well. If there's anyone listening to the show who says, "Yeah, these are particular phrases I've also not just the trio of yeah, yeah, kind yeah. you like <laughs> nonsense that Mark, Mark Latham is trotting mentioned. out to trot out but if you know of any others you can certainly contribute to that wiki and um, add to the knowledge base out there that'd be great so a fairly nasty web of words in our words of the week great well now that we've proven that Mark Latham is regrettable Kylie and I are going to jump out of here but hey I bet Daniel wants to have a look at your emoji strings from the yes! top of the show I certainly yes! do and send in any baby myths anything that you have heard or thought oh, yeah, what experiments what have you performed Come on, on your you children budding Piaget's out there show us your, your experiments why don't you get this to us? Uh, I can still take a call, 9260-9210, or email talkthetalk at rtrfm.com.au. My very favourite place to hang out is the Talk the Talk Facebook page. Our community are the coolest you in are a nerdy way. amazing. And, of course, there's other social media forms like Twitter, so you can hashtag RTRFM or check us out on the actual account, Talk RTR. But now let's listen to Beacon with Safety's Off on RTRFM 92.1. 
Beacon there with safeties off on RTRFM 92.1. You're here in the closing minutes of Talk the Talk with me, Daniel. Let's see. We have a number of people who have given us their emoji strings. Uh, Nicola gives us cloud and arm. That's shaking fist at cloud. I'm going to use that one. John gives us the uh, sarcastic face with a finger pointing up and then a finger pointing at you. Hey, baby. I'm guessing that means great to see you. You're doing awesome. Hey. Ed gives us uh, an eggplant emoji all by itself. What's up with that, Ed? I asked. I now have to ask you if you habitually combine that with another emoji. He responded with the lick. Okay. We're just going to move along. Kylie says... uh, Halo plus a a date. Thank God it's Friday. Josh gives us his top emoji, the Spock fingers, the poop, the heart. Oh, what a bunch of classic ones. I guess those are the ones that uh, they don't combine in any syntactic way, but they're often used together. Great stuff. Thanks, everybody, for your strings of emojis. Elise gives us an email. Hi, just listened to the latest show and was interested in the Word of the Week segment about knee, knee voters, which is the French uh, neither nor voters who didn't vote for anyone. In the Indonesian language, the act of casting a spoiled ballot is referred to as golput, which is abbreviated from golangang puti, which literally means white or blank section because you're not filling in the box. Cool. Graham says, I'm going to take you up on knee knee, and it's a U.S. equivalent and donkey voting. Knee knee is a measure of people who are engaged in the political process who choose not to vote or to turn up to vote and not select a candidate. Uh, you know about the situation in Australia. So folks who choose not to vote or leave their ballot blank may not be engaged in the process and may be doing it just to avoid a fine. Donkey voting is completely different and is maybe only possible in Australia since we have to number the boxes. A donkey vote is a valid vote where the voter ranks the candidates in the order they appear on the ballot paper. It suggests disengagement with the political process. All said, then, it's pretty hard to identify Australian ninis. Thanks, Graham. Awesome. Erica had an interesting addendum to our sandwich episode 287. See, if you remember our sandwich episode, I proposed the following test. You can say, you can have a PB&J or you can have a PB&J sandwich. And if your brain goes, "Mm, that's literally the same thing, then that thing is a sandwich because adding the modifier sandwich doesn't change anything. But if I say you can have a taco or you can have a taco sandwich and you're brain goes, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that could be. I mean, you start imagining taco stuff on bread or something. Then a taco is not a sandwich because adding the modifier sandwich changes what that thing is. So, you know, is a, do you want a Subway or do you want a Subway sandwich? And so I used this test to show that a hamburger was not a sandwich because if you say, I can make you a hamburger or I can make you a hamburger sandwich, your brain says, oh, I wonder what that is, hamburger sandwich. Well, Erica has somehow come up with a photograph of a menu in or near Chicago, USA, that offers, yes, a hamburger sandwich. So I had to know what that was, and she delivered. She sent me back a photo of some hamburger between two slices of bread with a toothpick through an olive. Now that tells me that a hamburger is not a sandwich. As I predicted, Daniel Rule confirmed. Now, I told my oldest son about the hamburger sandwich. I said, you know, what do you think a hamburger sandwich would look like? And he said, "Mm, two hamburgers with peanut butter and jam in the middle. I said, get serious. So I described the sandwich, you know, a hamburger patty with bread. And he said, that's what you do when you run out of buns. No one does that unless they're forced to. And I explained that elite restaurants in Chicago actually do. And he said, well, they need to stop. Because that's, he says, that's what burgers need, more, you know, corners without anything in them. You know that part where you bite into the burger and there's no meat? Would you like more of that? That's what we need. He says, I'm pretty sure that Germans put round pieces of meat in round pieces of bread for a reason. So sarcastic in his 20s. Kendon says, uh, Daniel proposed a test for sandwichness that I call the XX sandwich test. Uh, I'd like to propose another test that we can call the X sandwich 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 test. For this, you insert the test subject into a structure like this. You eat the taco sandwich, and I'll eat the sandwich sandwich. If this feels right to us, then the thing is not a sandwich. And if it feels off, then we have a sandwich. In many cases, this can confirm the results of the earlier test. For example, it correctly predicts that a Pop-Tart is not a sandwich because you eat the Pop-Tart sandwich, and I'll eat the sandwich sandwich. Sounds okay. 
It also correctly predicts that ham and Swiss is a sandwich because you eat the ham and Swiss sandwich. I don't like the sandwich sandwich. It sounds a little off, probably because we already think of a ham and Swiss sandwich as a sandwich sandwich. However, things get more interesting with sub sandwiches. The sub sandwich is granted sandwich status by the X, X sandwich test, but not the X sandwich 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 test. You eat the sub sandwich, and I'll eat the sandwich sandwich, sounds perfectly acceptable to me. If we accept both tests, I think the sub sandwich suggests that we are dealing with sandwich gradients rather than a sandwich, not sandwich binary. Oh, I'm perfectly accepting of non-binaries in other ways. This is a great test. It does a great job of distinguishing, you know, the prototypical sandwiches, like the real sandwiches, from the edge cases. In fact, maybe it does too good a job because... When you ask for the sandwich sandwich, you're really asking for the prototypical sandwich, you know, the most sandwichy sandwich. I mean, what even slightly peripheral sandwich would do well against that kind of a test? So I think that if it passes my, do you want a taco or do you want a taco sandwich test, then it's a base level sandwich. But it, if it passes the taco sandwich or sandwich sandwich, then it has it has run the gauntlet. It has been through the fire. Not literally through the fire, because that might not make the sandwich taste as good, depending on what kind of sandwich. Perhaps you'd want a salad salad with that sandwich sandwich. More on that later. I'd like to thank everybody who sent in stuff and gave us ideas. Thanks all the researchers. Thanks to Ben and Kylie. Especially thanks to you for listening. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, keep talking. This has been an RTRFM podcast. RTRFM is an independent community radio station that relies on listeners for financial support. You can subscribe online at rtrfm.com.au slash subscribe. Our theme song is by R Trees, and you can check out their music on rtrees.com and everywhere good music is sold. We're on Twitter at TalkRTR. Send us an email, talkthetalk at rtrfm.com.au. And if you'd like to get lots of extra linguistic goodies, then like us on Facebook or check out our Patreon page. You can always find out whatever we're up to by heading to talk. TalkTheTalkPodcast.com.